OK, so let's go through. Um, 13 is divided into two PowerPoints. I have it, if you see it on, on Blackboard, there's a 13A and a 13B where the PowerPoints are located. And I just split the nervous system into central nervous system, 13A, and peripheral nervous system, 13B. So we'll definitely get through those two. And then maybe a little bit of 14, somatic nervous system um, as well. So let's kind of start here with 13A. Uh, give me a second to make this large for you guys. I won't be able to see the chat since I have it on slideshow mode. Um, but again, just unmute your mic if you have a, a question, no problem. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is, just so I don't just repeat the lectures that you have recordings of, um, these for unit four here, uh, as you go through it, you'll see that I underlined certain things. See when I underlined, underlined. These are not underlined in the originals or the videos. Um, that's just the stuff I'm going to hit on, because um, I just want it to be very focused. Uh, little session. Uh, that does not mean uh, ignore everything else. All that means is these are the most likely areas for questions to come from because they're just areas that seem to be hit on more. And of course, you get questions randomly. So there's, I, I, the purpose is to kind of focus you in certain areas. Um, but again, uh, fair game is anything that is in my PowerPoints or videos. Um, but this is more of a focus on just certain certain concepts to be sure not to ignore, right? Not to ignore anything else, but if you're gonna ignore something, not anything that we have underlined here. So starting with the central nervous system, with this, which is the brain and spinal cord, uh, the brain is gonna be divided up into four main units here or, or parts. So when we go to the cerebrum, which is the main part of the brain, we should know what a gyrus versus a sulcus is, which is a ridge, versus a groove. We should know the longitudinal fissure separates the two hemispheres like you see here. And the corpus callosum actually connects the left and the right side of the brain. So it's actually that red thing that's deep. These are fibers connecting the two hemispheres. We have five lobes in the brain that are listed here, frontal, parietal, temporal, occipital, and insula. However, as we're going through this, uh, well, I'll explain these once, once we get to their particular or specific slide. Of course, we should know the central sulcus separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. And on the frontal lobe side of it, there's a precentral gyrus. On the parietal lobe side of the central sulcus, there's a postcentral gyrus. So if I go to a picture, that would be the precentral gyrus. There's the central sulcus. There's the postcentral gyrus. We'll be adding functions to these in a minute. And the lateral sulcus outlines out the temporal lobe Oops. that you can see being pulled apart here with the insula that's deep to it. Now that should be quite familiar from lab if, if uh, you've been keeping up with lab. So, so far it should be no problem. Uh, the cerebral cortex is this thin layer of gray matter, which is outlined in dark here uh, on the surface of the cerebrum, which is the site of your conscious mind. And as I skip through Broadman's areas, you can see that I have underlined the part of the brain and something that you should associate it with as far as function. So this is good flashcard material, right? Occipital lobe, visual perception, temporal lobe, auditory, and olfactory, which is, of course, hearing and smell, sense of smell. So very important, these underlined parts match the part of the brain with what's perceived in that part of the brain. So in the frontal lobe, we have a couple areas, mainly that precentral gyrus on either hemisphere, right? And that's the site of your primary motor cortex. Cortex. So the precentral gyrus is the structural name of this elevated portion right here, but the functional part of it is called the primary motor cortex, and it's somatic. So this is where our neurons begin, right, that supply our skeletal muscles, right, our voluntary nervous system, which is somatic, right, and that's where the thought begins to move a part of your body. Well, their, their cells are located right in there. Okay. Um, and this is just depicts the part of the brain that's responsible for the muscles and parts of the body. 
And uh, this term here, contralateral, means that the left hemisphere, well actually this is the right, it's facing you, the right hemisphere controls the left side of the body and the left hemisphere controls the right side of the body. So the far fibers cross over and that's what contralateral motor innervation of body regions means. And the most important part of the frontal lobe on this slide, remember we already covered the primary motor cortex, that would be this area right here, which is Broca's area, which you know is responsible, should know is responsible for uh, movements required uh, for speech. So the muscles involved with speaking is uh, the responsibility of Broca's area right there. In the parietal lobe, well, just recall a second ago, this was your primary motor cortex on the frontal lobe here on that precentral gyrus. Well, on the postcentral gyrus in the parietal lobe, that's your somatosensation area or your somatosensory cortex. So all of that information coming up, sensory information to the brain uh, from the receptors in your skin for light touch, pressure, tickle, pain, itch, right, and so on, uh, gets perceived on this gyrus right there, the postcentral gyrus. So in the frontal lobe, it was all motor, right? We had the motor somatic along that postcentral gyrus, the primary motor area, motor for speech, right? Muscles involved with speeching was Broca's area. When we get in the parietal lobe, that's sensory. So this information coming up to the brain, especially right on this postcentral gyrus for uh, the somatosensory cortex. I should have underlined this. I just noticed that I missed it. But Wernicke's area, weird pronunciation, Wernicke's area, sort of in here. It's more than one. It's more than just the parietal lobe, but it's, it's uh, it does involve the, it does involve the parietal lobe. That's comprehension of speech. You're able to understand speech in that part of the brain. Different from Broca's. Remember, Broca's is to produce speech, muscles, movement, motor but this is to understand in Wernicke's. So be careful with those two. Uh, the limbic cortex, or actually I can go to the next slide, the limbic system or lim limbic association area. I just have certain words in bold for you to recognize. So associate that part of the brain with emotions and behavior. A posterior association, <laughs> easy to say, posterior association area for awareness of where you're your limbs are located, where your spatial awareness of your body. Anterior association, just judgments, understanding what's acceptable, that kind of thing. So uh, I just have highlighted or bold type words or phrases for you to associate here, uh, what the part of the brain to the function. This is the insula slide. So you want to match with the insula, which is this lobe right there, taste which is also called gustation, because your gustatory cortex is in there on the insula. And it's also, the insula is also the site of visceral sensations. So that's not this, right? That's not, whoops, sorry. That's not somatosensory cortex. That came from parts of the skin, right? Touch, pressure. This sensation is visceral sensation. So this is information coming from your organs, goes to your insula. We don't typically know it's happening, right? Our brain is getting information coming from our visceral organs and our abdominal cavity, in our ventral cavity. Um, sometimes you're aware, for example, if you have an upset stomach, if you're hungry, if you have a full bladder, right? Then you are aware of it, but often you're not aware of the information your brain's getting from your organs. So with insula, you wanna match taste or gustation, and you wanna match visceral sensations or visceral sensory, right, to the insula as well. All right, the diencephalon is the next part of the brain. It's deep. It consists of two parts, thalamus and hypothalamus. What do we want to match with thalamus? Well, there's my underlying portions. Uh, it's responsible for sorting all that sensory information. We have tons of sen sensory information moving up towards the brain. So conveniently located right in the middle here is the thalamus and that's gonna relay the sensory information to all parts of the, of the cerebrum. For example, here's an impulse coming up maybe from your left thumb 
it'll say, well, you need to go to the somatosensory area right there, right? There's an impulse coming from maybe your stomach on well, saying, well, you need to go to the insula, which you can't really see here. So there you go. Hypothalamus, this is a big one and it's sort of all crammed here. It's all important. So this small region of the brain right there, responsible for a lot, right? Homeostasis, right? Maintaining steady states within the body. Your ANS, autonomic nervous system, big one. Uh, that's chapter 15 that we're gonna go through Friday. Um, your endocrine system, that's glands that secrete hormones. Temperature control, so small area, but massive amount of function. So don't forget these underlined areas here that you wanna match with the, the hypothalamus. Oh, the epithalamus is just this part of the diencephalon way back here, not even labeled on this picture, but you can see it. Uh, that's the pineal gland, which uh, secretes melatonin for your sleep cycle. You should know the three parts of the brainstem from superior to inferior, midbrain, midbrain, pons, and medulla, and then match it with a function. The midbrain, especially in this area, which you saw in lab, corpora quadrigemina, where basically there's a superior inferior colliculus, was actually not even on this picture, uh, but it's just a relay area for visual information, a relay area for hearing, auditory information. That doesn't mean it's vision and hearing. We covered those two already, right? That just means it's just an area where fibers, I'll get this out of the way, kind of pass through, right, in order to, to get there. Pons, breathing rhythm, but it's secondary. It only helps with your rhythm of breathing. It's your medulla oblongata or just medulla that is your respiratory center. So this little area just down here, the medulla, that's controlling your rate of respiration, but it's also your cardiovascular center, which is made up of the cardiac center for your heart rate and force of contraction and your vasomotor center, that's the vascular part, which controls your blood vessels because they have smooth muscles in their walls which can constrict them or dilate them to regulate blood pressure. All right. uh, cerebellum means little brain. We labeled it there in lab, but I just underlined just some key words like coordinated movements, smooth movements, uh, calculates the way to smoothly coordinate muscle contraction. All right, so it's just, uh, it just helps with balance and coordination, our cerebellum. Oh, the arbor vitae, which we know from lab, or at least we should, right, is the white matter inside of the cerebellum. Then we get to the spinal cord. By the way, we just went through just a bunch of brain parts and that is all just matching the part with its function. So if you kind of pay attention to my underlined areas there, um, yeah, that's, that's, you'll be pretty good for that part um, as far as test questions go. Uh, spinal cord begins at the foramen magnum, the large opening in the oops, occipital bone. Uh, that's where the medulla ends which is the inferior portion of the brainstem, and the spinal cord begins. And it'll run inside your vertebrae in the vertebral canals, right, until we get to about L1 or L2, and that's where the spinal cord ends, which you can see right here. There's the beginning, and there's the end. And we'll see on the next couple slides, this conus medullaris, sorry, conus medullaris is the end, the inferior tip of the spinal cord. The phylum terminale in green anchors it to the coccyx bone to keep it taut. And then these nerves that hang down, they're actually their nerve roots that hang down from the conus medullaris. It's called the cauda equina, which again from lab we know means horse's tail, uh, until they exit their own little spot between each vertebra. So there you go. Conus medullaris, phylum terminale were two important words, right? Phylum anchors the spinal cord. The cauda equina is the nerve roots at the inferior end of the spinal cord. And also we should know that there's 31 pairs of spinal nerves, but that's on the next PowerPoint. 
it's part of the peripheral nervous system. This one has to do with the central nervous system. All right, don't really have anything underlined here. These are good labels for lab. Right, and then we have horns listed throughout here, and that's just saying, well, the spinal cord has uh, white matter on the outside, gray matter in the inside. The gray matter is divided into horns, and I'll use this picture. You got a ventral horn, you got a dorsal horn, and you got a lateral horn, that little piece sticking out right there. Um, the white matter is is broken up into columns, but that's not on the slide. But what I have underlined here, we should we should associate dorsal horns with sensory input, ventral horns with motor input. And then if we come out of the spinal cord here, these are called roots. So this is your ventral root, there's your dorsal root, and if you're keeping up with lab, you've already know this. So this ventral side, the ventral horn, ventral gray horn and the ventral root are motor, right? So information just flows in one direction out of the spinal cord, out towards the body. Where the dorsal side, there's the dorsal root ganglion, the cluster of cell bodies, there's the dorsal root and the dorsal gray horn. That dorsal side, the root and the horn, is all sensory, meaning information is moving in to the central nervous system. Worry about the tracks here. You are not gonna get tested on tracks. Um, I've never seen it on a test, so I'm gonna go all the way to the meninges, and that's next, which will be on the next slide. So another thing that you should know are the three layers of the meninges and where they're located as far as what's the deepest, what's the most superficial. Or the dura, mat the dura mater is your outer layer, most superficial layer. It's actually the gray and the pink there. It's very thick. It's got two sub layers, which I wouldn't worry about. But that's the tough outer layer of membrane that surrounds the brain and spinal cord. All three together are called the meninges, but there is your thick dura mater. Um, it's just inside the cranial bones there. Right? If we go a little deeper, we see this layer, which is the arachnoid mater. Arachnoid means resembling a spider. Well, it's because it's got all these little webs on it, and that creates a space between itself and the innermost layer, which is actually attached to the brain and spinal cord tissue, and that's the pia mater, which is the innermost layer of, uh, of the meninges. So there's your three from outside in, the tough outer, the ones with the webs on it, arachnoid mater, and then the soft little delicate pia mater, um, which is in contact with soft, delicate tissue. All right, and there's just a slide on each, but we already explained it, the dura. Um, the arachnoid mater, kind of pause for a second there. It says the subarachnoid space contains CSF. We're gonna cover CSF in a second, but the subarachnoid space is that space that those little webs create, right? That space between the arachnoid and the pia mater is called, this, called the subarachnoid space. That's where cerebral spinal fluid flows in, right? In this space. So you should know what that is already, cerebral spinal fluid, but if you don't, just hang tight because that'll be next. Of course, the pia mater is, clings tightly to the brain and spinal cord, uh, but it's the innermost layer. So here we go. Again, this is a lot of overlap with lab, which is kind of nice right, for once. Uh, we have four large spaces in the brains, which we call ventricles. In, in lab, we learned we have two lateral ventricles, a third ventricle, and a fourth ventricle, and then we have it's the connections. Uh, but cerebral spinal fluid is produced inside of these four ventricles. There's the functions. But uh, in lab, we learned what those connections were called, like the cerebral aqueduct, the interventricular foramina right there. But that's fine. I'm gonna kind of move here, but it says all four ventricles contain a choroid plexus that produce the CSF. So let's explain that. 
Well, there's the ventricles again, but I'm looking inside a ventricle here. This is just a cross section. This happens to be the third ventricle. And I see this cluster of blood vessels. That's what the choroid plexus is. And that's where the fluid comes from that fills up the ventricle. And that's a clear fluid coming out from the blood. Um, and that's what cerebrospinal fluid is, right? Uh, the clear part of blood escaping from the walls of these blood vessels. And it's called the choroid plexus. So every ventricle has a choroid plexus. The third ventricle, you see it on the fourth ventricle. And if you could see the lateral ventricles on this image, which you can't, they would have a choroid plexus as well. So the cerebrospinal fluid flows from ventricle to ventricle, right? It'll eventually enter the subarachnoid space. Remember that space, right? Flow around the brain and spinal cord and eventually get dumped back into the blood up here. And that's the superior sagittal sinus, which we learned about in the lab. Yeah, one more important point on this PowerPoint is that um, this is just a, a magnified image of one of these tiny little blood vessels, right? These red blood cells are microscopic, so kind of get an idea how small this is. So in the choroid plexus, these blood vessels, right, well, which is the choroid plexus in the ventricles, are surrounded by these cells, which you know from the nervous system. They're one of our six neuroglia. They're called ependymal cells, They're right there. Ependymal cells have cilia, like you can see. So when the fluid leaves the choroid plexus, the cilia beat, right? They do their little beats, and that helps to propel the cerebrospinal fluid throughout the system. So there it is, ependymal cells help to circulate cerebrospinal fluid. That's good. And that, that's actually not the end of the chapter. That's the end of the PowerPoint. I kind of split the chapter up into two PowerPoints, if you have those downloaded. Actually, since I was off. Oh, that's fine. OK. Um, so this is the second part of chapter 13. Uh, we covered just covered the central nervous system, little crash course. Now I'll we'll have a little crash course on the peripheral nervous system. Uh, and our last two chapters, 14 and 15, we'll get into more some specifics with the somatic and the autonomic here. Uh, but we're staying general here in the peripheral sensory and motor divisions of the peripheral nervous system. All right, so this is a little review for something you've already been tested on in unit three, but is fair game here too. That a ganglia, right, those are cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. In the central nervous system, they're called nuclei. And the same thing in the peripheral nervous system, we have nerves. In the central nervous system, we have tracts. So that's just a little recall or review, because of course that's gonna be important here too. Uh, but since we're in the central nervous system, we're dealing with uh, nuclei. Well, we were in the central nervous system, so there exists nuclei and tracts, but now we're in the peripheral nervous system, so we have ganglia and nerves. Same things, they just have different names and different systems. All right, I'm, as I said, if it's not underlined, I'm just going to run through. All right, here, here we go. So we can classify the nerves according to function. So if a function, or if a nerve, I should say, carries information, and it does so in, by action potentials, electrical impulses, like we learned about last unit, um, if the information moves away from the CS, CNS, away from the brain and spinal cord toward an effector, of course, an effector is always a muscle or gland, that's a motor nerve or an efferent nerve. I guess this sh should be a uh, review from the neuron chapter that we, we had earlier. Um, if it carries information or impulses toward the CNS, that's sensory or an afferent nerve. But many nerves in our body are both sensory and motor, so we call those mixed nerves because they contain both fibers. So if we look at a nerve, right, these may be motor, carrying information in one direction, all right? This bundle might be sensory, carrying information in that direction. You see all the little axons in there, 
right? So a nerve is made up of tons of neurons, right? All these axons of different neurons. So if these are all motor, that's a motor nerve. These are all sensory, this is a sensory nerve. But if you have an area that's motor and areas that are sensory in the same nerve, right, then uh, we call that a, a mixed nerve. All right. So we're going into cranial nerves now, and I'm going through the pictures, that's lab stuff. But we should know, I'm gonna stop right here, for lecture, and a lot of this is for lab too, but for lecture, we need to know the 12 cranial nerves by name and by number. And you have to know the Roman numerals or they're just regular numbers, either one, uh, because of course these are multiple choice, so answer choices might be in Roman numerals, so it's important to know them for lecture. So the number, the name of the nerve, remember there's 12 of them, if it's sensory, motor, or mixed, and then, well, in this case, this happens to be sensory. Sensory for what? Well, smell. So I have everything underlined or bolded as you need it for each slide, uh, for, for each cranial nerve, I should say, but let's just run through it together. Cranial nerve one, Roman numeral is just an I. It's called the olfactory nerve. It says nerves, there's, there's one on each side for all 12. They're pa always paired, but that's fine. So cranial nerve one is the olfactory nerve, and it's only sensory, and it's for smell. And of course, olfaction or olfactory means smell. So there it is, olfactory cranial nerve one. Sometimes we call it the olfactory bulb, which becomes the olfactory tract. We saw that in lab, which goes to the brain. Good. Cranial nerve two is the optic nerve. So you want to know that two is just I, I, right? Optic nerve, good. Purely sensory, again, this is our second nerve. Both of them have been sensory so far, and it's for vision. So there's your optic nerve coming from each eye. In lab, we learned they meet at the optic chiasma, then they become the optic tract. And we just saw today that your visual center, your visual cortex is in the occipital lobe. So all of these fibers will eventually end up there for visual perception. Cranial nerve three is the oculomotor nerve. So three is I, 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 oculomotor. Uh, this is our first motor nerve. It's motor for eye movements. So since it's motor, fibers are leaving the brain or spinal cord heading towards an effector. In this case, the effector are muscles that surround the eye. And we have six muscles surrounding the eye. We know them from lab, but we'll go through them. We might get there today or maybe Friday. Uh, but four of those six extrinsic eye muscles that move your eyeball uh, is controlled by this nerve, right? Ocular motor literally means move the eyes. And uh, that's cranial nerve three. Cranial nerve four is the trochlear nerve. Four is IV, V is five. So the one before, it just means one less than five, so which, is, which is four. Trochlear nerve, well, it's also only motor. It says primarily, primarily, but we'll kind of make it just easy for us here. It's a motor nerve and it's also for eye movements, but just one of the six extrinsic eye muscles and it happens to be one called the superior oblique, which we'll see next chapter. And the reason we call it the trochlear nerve because this muscle goes through a little pulley system like you can see right here. And that little pulley is called a trochlea, which is how the cranial nerve got its name because it innervates that superior oblique muscle that uses the trochlea. So cranial nerve four, IV, right? Trochlear nerve, motor for eye movements. I'm going to skip five and go to six because I want to get the eye movements out of the way. So cranial nerve six is the abducens nerve. Six is VI, which is five plus one, right, which makes it six. And that will take care of the other extrinsic eye muscle, right? So you had ocular motor, four of the six, trochlear, one of the six, and now number six abducens, the other, the last one, one of six extrinsic eye muscles. And it happens to innervate the muscle right here that abducts the eye, which is why we call this nerve the abducens nerve for abduction, cranial nerve six. All right, so we had three cranial nerves just to move your eyes, three, four, and six, ocular motor, trochlear, and abducens. 
I skipped cranial nerve five, but five, cranial nerve five is the trigeminal nerve, and five is the V, right? It's large, largest cranial nerve, um, but because, well, it has three divisions, that's where the tri comes from, which you don't have to break apart because I didn't underline for you there. Um, but it's the first mixed nerve that we're running across of the cranial nerves because you can see it's sensory on the face. So all the sensation you feel on your face comes from the trigeminal nerve, uh, but it's motor for mastication, which we know means chewing. So because we have sensory on the face, motor for mastication, it's a mixed nerve. So there you can see sensory to all these parts of the face, right? all those receptors in our dermis, tactile corpuscle, Asinian corpuscle, all those that we've learned in the past, but it's motor to muscles of mastication, like the masseter. You might know that from lab. There's the temporalis that's cut, those pterygoid muscles, right? So we've learned these muscles in the past, but uh, that's the motor portion. There's the sensory portion of the V, which is the cranial nerve five, trigeminal nerve. We did six. Cranial nerve seven is also mixed. So motor for facial expression. So all those muscles in your, your all those facial muscles, that are your smile muscles, your frown muscles, like the zygomaticus muscles, the depressor anguli oris, rosorius, occipital frontalis, all those muscles that move your soft tissue around in your face for facial expression, that's the motor portion of the facial nerve. The sensory portion is taste, but only from the anterior two thirds of the tongue. So since you have motor for facial expression, sensory for taste, it's a mixed nerve. And you can see right here, there's the sensory portion on the tongue for taste, anterior two thirds. And all of these muscles that we've learned, that we've labeled already and had a test on already, uh, of these facial muscles are supplied by the facial nerve. Remember, the facial nerve is not sensory for face, right? For the face, sensory for the face was five, trigeminal. It's motor on these muscles on the face. That's why it's called the facial nerve for its motor part. Sensory part is the taste. Cranial nerve eight, which is, oh, I didn't mention seven is VII, which is five plus two, right, which is seven. Cranial nerve eight is the vestibulocochlear nerve, and the Roman numeral is VIII, which is five plus one plus one plus one, right, which makes eight. And we'll see in the next chapter that our cochlea in our inner ear is for hearing. There's the cochlear nerve. We have a vestibule in our inner ear for equilibrium. There's the vestibular nerve. So take those two nerves, the cochlear nerve and vestibular nerve for hearing and for equilibrium. They come together to form one cranial nerve called vestibulocochlear nerve, just putting the two parts together. And therefore hearing and from equilibrium because they come from those two important parts of the inner ear. So there's your cranial nerve eight, VIII, vestibulocochlear nerve, sensory for hearing and equilibrium. Now it says mostly sensory, but I just underlined sensory. There's a very small motor component to it that goes the other way. Uh, but 99% of the nerve is sensory, so let's just stick with that. Cranial nerve nine is the glossopharyngeal nerve. Uh, nine is IX because X is 10, so I uh, one minus 10, right, would be nine because the, the one is on the left side. If it was on the other side, it would be 11, right? But there's cranial nerve nine, glossopharyngeal nerve. Glosso means tongue. Pharyngeal means throat, so if you think tongue, throat, we need that to, for swallowing. Uh, so there's your motor function, tongue and throat, pharynx is the throat for swallowing. So that's what this is named after, but it's motor function, but it is a mixed nerve because it has a sensory function. Right? If you remember that cranial nerve seven was taste for the anterior two thirds of the tongue, well, what about the rest of the tongue? Well, there it is, the posterior one third for taste uh, right there, right there's your glossopharyngeal nerve. That's the sensory portion. 
cranial nerve 10, which is X is 10, we call the vagus nerve because it's a wanderer, which is what vagus means, wanderer, because you can see it leaves the head and neck area and it goes all the way down and innervates a lot of your visceral organs. So it's uh, acting not like a cranial nerve, it's acting like a spinal nerve as far as where it's functioning, which is where it got its name from. But we can see it's a mixed nerve, motor to your organs in your ventral cavity, thoracic cavity, and abdominal cavity. It's also sensory from those organs as well. So that's what makes it a mixed nerve, just motor and sensory to your ventral cavity organs. Uh, and again, the motor, well, I should say again, I have, we haven't mentioned this yet, but we'll see in the last chapter that it's uh, the motor portion to your abdominal organs is your parasympathetic system, but we'll worry about that later. Um, sensory from the organs as well, and that, that information goes to the insula, you might remember from a couple minutes or maybe 20 minutes ago. Um, but it's also sensory for your, some taste buds uh, a lot around, a little bit on the tongue, not much, but around the throat, back of the throat area, an epiglottis area. So we have more taste buds. So here's another nerve that's involved with taste as part of its sensory component. All right, so there's our mixed nerve, the motor and the sensory. Cranial nerve 11 is XI, which is 10 plus one, makes it 11 as the accessory nerve. And this one's real simple. It's motor to these, well, two muscles, you can see the trapezius pretty easily, and you see part of the sternocleidomastoid, but it runs to the front side, so you don't see it all. And it's just motor for those two very large muscles, which is why it's so wide, because these are massive muscles, especially the trapezius, it needs a lot of innervation. So cranial nerve 11, XI, accessory nerve, motor to the trapezius and sternocleidomastoid. Cranial nerve 12 is the hypoglossal nerve, and that literally means under the tongue, and it's motor for swallowing and speech, which is what tongue being a major muscle here that helps us perform those actions. So simple one to end with, 12, swallowing speech, which are motor functions. So I have all these underlined here because I just took some components from all the cranial nerves. Definitely know the number, the name, the function of each, sensory motor mixed and for what, uh, but also be able to group them, right? These are your sensory cranial nerves. I have a little asterisk here because remember this is mostly sensory, but we're just considering it sensory because it's 99% sensory, number eight. Uh, vestibulocochlear, so there's our three sensory nerves. There's our five motor nerves. We have four mixed cranial nerves, three that are involved with taste, and not just taste. They have motor components too, but as far as taste comes from three different cranial nerves, seven, nine, 10. And then we have three just for eye movements that we saw earlier, three, four, and six. So it's just a nice little organizational chart if you're asked kind of to group things according to function. Those were the 12 cranial nerves. We have spinal nerves, we have 31 pairs of them. So a lot more spinal nerves than there are cranial nerves, but their names are very easy because they're just named according to the vertebrae from which they exit. So they're all mixed, all 31 pairs of spinal nerves are mixed, and there they are, right? We have, uh, eight cervical, so I underline this because that's an important point. There's only seven cervical vertebrae, but there's eight cervical spinal nerves, C1 to C8. Vertebrae, there's just C1 to C7, but spinal nerves, C1 to C8. You can see the rest follow suit as far as the number of spinal nerves, right, versus the vertebrae. Sacrum is actually five bones that are fused into one. Uh, but there's your kind of your special case right there. And I think on the next slide, yeah only seven cervical vertebrae, yet eight pairs of cervical spinal nerves. Good. All right, what a, let me just see what we're looking at here. Yeah, so um, coming, this is uh, ex 
extending from last PowerPoint. When we looked at the spinal cord, we had the roots coming out of the ends of the spinal cords, a ventral and dorsal root. We'll see a picture of it in a second. But the ventral root is motor only, like we said earlier, efferent. The dorsal root is only sensory, afferent. And there it is, right? So there's your motor root, sorry, motor. <laughs> ventral root which is motor and your dorsal root which is sensory those two roots come together right here to form the spinal nerve and that's why all 31 pairs of spinal nerves are mixed because they contain both roots the, the ventral and the dorsal root now the dorsal ramus and the ventral ramus are mixed so that's kind of could be a little confusing the roots are either motor or sensory ventral is motor dorsal is sensory then we go to the spinal nerve but if we keep going there's a spinal nerve keep going then the spinal nerve breaks up into a ventral ramus and a dorsal ramus and they're both mixed so you have motor and sensory going to the back of the body motor and sensory going to the front of the body all right so just just kind of pay attention to that if we're talking about the roots they're separated into motor and sensory if we're dealing with the rami dorsal ventral ramus not root those are mixed fibers okay now the ventral rami which are the main rami of course they're mixed uh, form plexuses again a lot of this is overlap from our lab course and a plexus are interlacing nerves, intertwining tangles. So we have a cervical plexus right there, a brachial plexus. Down here we have a lumbar plexus. And then way down here we have a sacral plexus kind of outlined. So you should know the four plexuses. Now what's missing is thoracic because it does not have a plexus. You notice how all these spinal nerves, at least the ventral rami of the spinal nerves, are parallel to each other. They do not interlace. They become intercostal nerves in between our ribs. That's why they're also nice and parallel with each other. So there is no plexus in the thoracics. We just have a cervical plexus. At the base of the neck, we have a brachial plexus because those nerves will eventually go down the arm. All right. I'm just going to the next. Okay, so the last part of this chapter, I think that's the most important, is be able to match the nerves, the ma major nerve that come from each plexus. So the cervical plexus gives rise to a lot of cutaneous nerves that go to the skin, but the one of the main nerves that arises from the brachial, sorry, from the cervical plexus is the phrenic nerve, which innervates the diaphragm. Diaphragm's nowhere near here, cervical plexus, but there's the phrenic nerve. If you were to follow that nerve, it would go all the way down to that primary breathing muscle, which we learned in an earlier unit, uh, the diaphragm. Brachial plexus, you could ignore this part here. Right? You know these five nerves that are nerves coming from the brachial plexus, the five largest ones. We labeled these in labs, but you should know the axillary, musculocutaneous, median, ulnar, and radial are brachial plexus nerves, which if you were to follow them, you can see right there. Match these two with the lumbar plexus, the femoral nerve, and the obturator nerve. Femoral supplies the anterior thigh right on the femur. Obturator goes to the adductor muscles in the, in the inner thigh. And sacral plexus, one main one, and that's the sciatic nerve, longest, thickest. It's actually two nerves in one, the tibial nerve and the common fibular nerve. Right? And you can see this large, thick sciatic nerve going right down the back of your thigh. At the knee, it splits to a common fibular and a tibial. And we'll have more branches, like we learned the sural nerve that's cut here um, in lab as well. All right, I'm not too worried about dermatones. Good. Yeah, so that's just a good overview of most important parts of chapter, what was that, 13, that I had split into A and B PowerPoints. Um, I want to check chat real quick, and there's nothing there. Uh, 
so yeah, don't ignore the entire videos or PowerPoints that I have, but definitely don't ignore what we just went over today. So we've got about 15 minutes or so, so let's go into 14. And I'm assuming a lot of you may not have got through all of 14 yet, just because it's a little early in the week still. Um, so I'm just going to run through uh, you know, just a, maybe half of 14 or maybe a quarter of 14. Um, and we'll finish 14 and cover 15. 15 is a short chapter. Might might be quite a few slides there, but as far as the material, um, it's the shortest of the three chapters, chapter 15. So let's just get uh, get about 15 minutes of 14 in, and then we'll pick up from there on, on Friday. All right, so 14, we're talking about the somatic nervous system. Uh, let me enlarge this here. All right, so here's your somatic nervous system. And we can see it's, we're in the peripheral nervous system. We just covered that. Peripheral nervous system is motor and it's sensory, right? Motor is somatic and autonomic. Uh, so with the somatic nervous system, we're dealing with the voluntary nerve. So these are nerves going to skeletal muscle that we consciously control, not the other effectors. Smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands are autonomic nervous system but somatic is motor nerves to your skeletal muscle. But that's just a really small part of this chapter at the end. We won't even get there today. The sensory division, it's not showing it on this flow chart, but it also has a somatic portion. You might recall from chapter eh, 11, was it 12? I think it was, no, I think it was chapter, I can't remember. I think it might've been 12, but regardless, the sensory division of the peripheral nervous system could be somatic or visceral. So somatic sensory, we said back then, we said is the sensory that we're information that we're typically aware of, like touch, pain, pressure, and even your special senses, right? Like uh, vision, hearing, smell, taste. You know, we were aware of these things. That's your, that's your somatic sensory division, which is most of this chapter. Um, the other sensory part was visceral sensory. That's information going to your brain from your organs that you're not typically aware of. Remember, going to your insula. But, uh, we're concerned mainly with the somatic sensory or portion, and then we'll do a little bit somatic motor. At the end. Someone's got there. Hold on one second. I think it's gone. I think someone's unmuted. They got a little feedback or reverb, but okay. And I'm gonna hit just some review items that I have underlined. Yeah, so be able to match a receptor with what they're sensitive to, right? So mechanoreceptors, right, for movement, like touch, pressure, vibration, good. Thermoreceptors for temperature, photoreceptors respond to light, we'll see that probably next review session, we'll get there. Chemoreceptors, like in taste and smell, respond to chemicals, that's fine. Oop. Proprioceptors are in our muscles, tendons, and ligaments. And we're gonna, in this chapter, look at the special senses, which is part of your somatic nervous system, but the sensory portion of your somatic nervous system. Recall general senses are just throughout your body mainly in the dermis, right? For touch and pressure, pressure vibration, um, also proprioceptors in our tendons, but special senses are in our head, around our head area, and they have organs that are dedicated specifically for that sense, not your entire body, right? Like vision, hearing, right, and so on. So uh, let's look at some just real simple ones here. Gustation, of course, we already know means taste. You might want to equate with that with the insula from chapter 13, not too long ago. I didn't really underline anything there uh, until the very end of it, uh, but our gustatory pathway, right, from the taste buds, uh, there is your cranial nerve seven, anterior two-thirds of the tongue. There's cranial nerve nine, posterior one-third, and vagus, which is sort of the back of the throat area. And those are the three cranial nerves involved with taste that go from your taste buds. And we know where taste is perceived in the insula, right? From chapter 13, just a, what, 20, 30 minutes ago. 
Smell is olfaction or your olfactory epithelium is in your uh, nasal cavity. And if I wanna go through it here, I can see, well, there's your receptors, your chemoreceptors that pick up the chemicals in the air. There's your cranial nerve one, olfactory nerve, which is also called the olfactory bulb. And we know that's gonna go to the temporal lobe. Does it say it there? Yeah, perception is in the temporal lobe um, from last chapter. All right, so I'm gonna kind of introduce hearing here because it's a big part of this chapter and so is vision. I will definitely do vision on Friday. So you have time to kind of go through it, but let me kind of introduce the hearing and the, the vision, I'm sorry, the, the hearing and balance part of this chapter. So three major areas of the ear, external, middle, and internal. But the internal ear is where our hearing receptors are located and where our receptors for equilibrium are located. All right, so there's your external ear with your auricle and external acoustic meatus. It's just this ear canal there. Your external ear ends at the tympanic membrane, which is the eardrum. Then we have three ossicles, malleus, incus, and stapes. Right, these are all lab parts that most of us went through. If you're not in my lab, you might not have gotten here yet. It might be there, your last lab. Um, there's your, we call this the auditory tube in lab. It has many names, eustachian tube, pharyngotympanic tube. Uh, that will equalize the pressure between the middle ear and the throat when you change in elevation. Uh, then your inner ear has three parts to it, the cochlea, vestibule, and semicircular canal. So I just kind of pointed those out. So let's kind of run through this. All right, oracle is the, or pinna is the external part of your ear, and that's the canal. External acoustic meatus. Tympanic membrane's the eardrum. It's the boundary between the external and middle ear. And its job is to transfer sound waves or energy to those three bones in the middle ear, the ossicles which are the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, which you should know those in order, right? From the tympanic membrane, malleus, incus, and then the stapes. So it says transmits vibrations from the eardrum, which is the tympanic membrane, to the oval window. So I need to explain that, and I will on the next slide, right? But here's your pharyngotympanic tube. Now we called it the auditory tube in lab. Here it was labeled Eustachian tube. So like I said, it has lots, and lots of names, but this is the, it's probably which one is used the most, pharyngotympanic tube. Um, I used auditory in lab because you have to spell in lab and that's much easier to spell. But uh, I'll go to a picture now. So when the sound wave hits the eardrum, the tympanic membrane, it vibrates. That causes your three ossicles to vibrate. Now we have mechanical energy. Malleus vibrates with the incus, which vibrates with the stapes. And the stapes is connected to the inner ear through this oval window, which it's attached to. But, um, this is your pharyngotympanic or auditory tube. And that opens up to when your ears pop, right, to equalize the pressure with the outside because this is connected to your throat. All right. Uh, Children get middle ear infections because right, their pharyngotympanic tube is really small, right? Especially in infants. So from the throat, there's bacteria does not have a long way to go in, in infants for to, uh, to travel up into the middle ear where they would multiply. Your white blood cells would be fighting the infection. Pus would build up. That puts pressure on the eardrum, which hurts. Um, and it, a myringotomy is tubes in the ears, basically uh, putting a little tube, which is like a string, it's so small, so for that uh, if antibiotics don't work for the uh, uh, pus and pressure to be able to get out, right, to, to relieve symptoms and also to take the pressure off the tympanic membrane so it can vibrate properly again, but that's fine. Just should know that otitis media is the name for the middle ear infection, which is a very common uh, infection in children. All right, internal ear. So this is where all the nervous system part of the ear is located. Um, it 
it says two major divisions, but then I list three regions. But when we say major divisions, what we're talking about is function. So that's hearing and equilibrium or balance, right? So those are the two functional divisions. And that happens in three different regions. So the cochlea right there, which means snail, that's where your receptors for hearing are located. The vestibule and semicircular canals, vestibule here, these two sacs, and semicircular canals is where your receptors for equilibrium are located. So vestibule and semicircular is for equilibrium, cochlea is for hearing. Uh, so there's two types of equilibrium which we'll get into kind of in a second here. All right, so let's go through the cochlea and I'm gonna just take a quick, yeah, so we're right at five. I'm just gonna cover the cochlea and then I'll overlap with that on Friday. We'll start with the inner ear on Friday, but since I mentioned the cochlea, let's just finish it, finish it off here. Um, inside the cochlea, we have the receptor for hearing. It's called the organ of cordy. And it's usually called that. On tests, it's always called that organ of cordy. You see it has another name, spiral organ. That's the little receptor right, that allows us to hear. That's where the nerve impulse begins. right? And if I look, no, let me go here. This is the cochlea, but it's unraveled. So it's not so complicated to look like. Remember, it's a big swirl. Uh, so inside the cochlea, we have this duct, right? It's called the cochlear duct. Inside that cochlear duct, there's the label. By the way, the membrane is called the basilar membrane of the cochlear duct. But inside of this cochlear duct is your organ of cordy. So if I enlarge it, right, this is inside the cochlear duct. We see this little membrane and these tiny little cells, right? So these little cells and this membrane, this is your organ of cordy. So basically, when this membrane presses against these little cilia, they're called stereocilia, they bend. When those cilia bend, right, there's the action potential that goes down cranial nerve 8, vestibulocochlear nerve, right, to the brain. So this is your organ of cordy, and it's found, that was microscopic, and there's tons of those, thousands and thousands of these little organs of cordy, little receptors, all the way through this cochlear duct. So the point is, when these ossicles vibrate back and forth, the stapes is pounding on the oval window, and that causes the fluid to move around the near the cochlear duct, and it actually can go all the way around if it wants to the round window, but that's fine. Now, if this frequency of sound, right, this, this wave of fluid, if the sound is within our hearing range, it's gonna deform the cochlear duct somewhere. Right, so that will cause the bending of the cells and that these little cilia in that particular spot, right? And that will send the information to the brain. Now, look at this here. I know I kind of skipped. If the cochlear duct is disturbed here, well, the organ of cordy here will be very high pitch. If this wave disturbs it somewhere in the middle, again, this is the cochlea. It would be very swirly, but they just straightened it, so it's easy to look at. This is a medium frequency sound. Down here is a low frequency sound. So all these organs of cordy, all these receptors for hearing in our cochlear duct, right, are pre-programmed to tell our brain if it's high pitch, way over here, or if it's low pitch, way over there. I almost think of it like a keyboard with the low notes on one side, the high notes on the other side, right, because those pitches will deform that basilar membrane, the membrane of the cochlear duct, in a specific location, which tells the brain that, uh, uh, which which pitch is uh, being perceived. All right. So I'm going to kind of overlap with that on, on Friday because we're kind of over an hour, and this is where the brain starts not wanting any more information at that point. So, uh, yeah, so the big things with the cochlea, the cochlea contains this cochlear duct inside the cochlear duct, is where the organ of cordy is located, and those are the receptors for hearing. And that's the main part of the cochlea. So we're gonna do the same thing Friday with the other two parts. Let me find them. 
sorry, I know I'm skipping around here. Yeah, that's the cochlea. So the vestibule and semicircles, the semicircular canals are responsible for equilibrium. So we're gonna find out what are their receptors for equilibrium, what type, why are they different? How are the types of equilibrium different between these two regions? And we'll go from there. So we'll finish this chapter Friday. I'm gonna set it for 1.30. I'll send out an announcement and it'll be recorded. Um, and then uh, we'll cover chapter 15 as well, which is relatively short. So, all right. All right, and yeah, just let me know if you have questions and I'll just hang out here until you, everyone logs off. So, thank you. <laughs>